All right. We are done with, with Todd and Rod, I think. Is there another slide? I'll see. I think we're done. Um, so let's go to um, uh, the final. Um, let's go to the, the next talk, which is uh, Dr. Jose Campos. Um, now, uh, actually, I lied uh, to Garrett and the Rock the House team. This does actually have uh, audio as well. So um, it's going to be the same sort of thing. So um, let's pull this up. Let me explain. Uh, uh, let me give us some background on Dr. Campos. Uh, Jose is a pediatric surgeon in Chile. Um, uh, I used to think because I only knew Miguel Gilfond, I didn't think there were any good pediatric surgeons down there, but I realized that there actually are. Um, so uh, Jose Campos uh, has done something miraculous. He came up to me at an IPEG meeting and said, you know, Todd, you're you're, 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 you're doing a terrible job. Uh, he said, you're, you're just highlighting, you know, Journal of Pediatric Surgery. What about all the other journals out there? We're missing those papers. We need to highlight the non-core journals. So Jose has been doing that and he's going to pick some, uh, some, some of the top ones he's been presenting throughout the year in the state current app. Jose, take it away. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, everyone at the Global Cast and Dean Stay Current in Pediatric Surgery app for this invite. I've I've been following this course for the last few years as an attendee and even as a trainee the first year. So I'm I'm really honored to be here. And I want to thank to the Chilean Society of Pediatric Surgery and also the 23 volunteers that work with me uh, in in creating this filter. Uh, let me see if I can. Next slide, please, while I get set this up. Uh, so let me just, I, I think uh, Todd explained how we, briefly how we do it, but just in 30 seconds, we're taking 33 of the most important pediatric, general pediatric journals, the most important surgical journals, and the top three clinical ones, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, and JAMA. That, that's on average 1,200 articles each month. So we're look, going through title and abstract just to find those pearls those um, pediatric surgical articles that are really high quality or really relevant that we shouldn't miss. That leaves us with 25 to 50. That's really a lot to, to chew still, I think. So we do some filtering, we do some rankings, we, we, we filter by specialty, by quality, by methodology, and then by popularity. We send out a poll to ask all general surgeons around uh, Chile, but everyone can, can join in and to find out whether they think that's a relevant article, yes or no. And then we distribute this information. We come up with a very narrow selection of 10 to 15 articles. Our main two channels are, of course, the current in pediatric surgery app and um, social media. So this is how it looks. We're doing some posts on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. We're doing some infographics. We're doing some videos that are unfortunately only in Spanish at the moment, but we can change that. And this is where we get, you can find this information on, uh, on the app. Uh, so you hit the menu button, then you go to articles on that second screen. You, there you see all, your, all of your sources, your pediatric surgical journals. And if you go to the right, then you find that icon, which is curated, um, curated content. And then you'll find the articles that we're highlighting. So that's, that's, that's enough for, for the intro. So we'll just do, uh, Todd gave us the difficult challenge of highlighting only five articles. It's, it's, it, it was a mess to go through all of this again and just find five. Uh, so these are the five ones that we'll share with you. And we'll do it just as Todd did it recently as a case, then a poll. We, we want everyone's opinion. So please, the, the people at the faculty, just shout out which, which is your option. Let's, let's fight a little bit, just like fight us just like Todd said. So the first case is a six-month-old male. He was previously healthy, but he comes to the emergency department with a bilious emesis. He looks lethargic and tachycardic on arrival, but he's stable after a, a normal saline bolus. His x-ray is non-specific, um, a bit weird, but not specific. Labs and urine are completely normal. Just for the sake of this case, let's say we're, we're suspicion of, of a mid gut volvulus mid-gut mal rotation and volvulus. So what would be your next image investigation? That's the question. So um, A would be an upper GI control study. B would be a, a CAT scan. A C would be an abdominal ultrasound. And D, would you take, would someone take this ch child through uh, directly to a laparotomy or laparoscopy? 
And while we are getting those poll options up, uh, let me ask Dr. Holcomb, what would you do? Is Dr. Holcomb no, with us? I have to try to find him. I think. Oh, sorry, in, sorry. In the wrong room Dr. somewhere. Someone We're trying else. to figure that out. Yeah. Dr. Sullins, <laughs> what would you do? I would call my radiologist and have him do an upper GI and stand there watching it. Okay. Do you find that easy to get? Like, is it readily available at your hospital anytime, any hour or? I think most uh, at, at UCLA, at Mattel Children's Hospital it is, but um, you know, we cover some um, community hospitals as well. It takes a little bit more to and direct communication and sort of an urgency and a couple extra phone calls. But I think most people under, at least in the community hospitals understand the urgency when you say that what you're trying to rule out, it just takes a little bit more handholding. Um, but, uh, so I would say definitely at the higher volume centers, but some of the community hospitals take a little bit more. Maybe people at the chat can, because it's an international audience, maybe people, people can see how, how easy it is for them to get an upper GI control study. Or Ellen, you can stop me at any time if you think the poll is already there. Yeah, it was, it's actually, well, it was tied for a while between upper GI and the ultrasound. Now it looks like more than half people are saying upper GI. Okay, why don't we just take the next slide and, and show the video of this article that might or might not change what people think about this. Este es un artículo relevante publicado en Archives of Disease in Childhood en 2021. La malrotación intestinal requiere un diagnóstico oportuno ya que sus consecuencias pueden llegar a ser graves. El estudio de esta condición ha consistido clásicamente en el tránsito esófago estómago duodenal, pero utiliza radiación ionizante, es difícil de interpretar y no está siempre disponible. El objetivo de este estudio es determinar la utilidad de la ultrasonografía para el diagnóstico de malrotación mediante una revisión sistemática y metaanálisis, el primero en su tipo. Incluye 17 estudios con un total de 2.257 pacientes. Entre sus resultados más relevantes destacan una sensibilidad del 94 y una especificidad del 100% en el diagnóstico de malrotación con o sin volvulo. Ante esta evidencia, el ultrasonido se convierte en una interesante alternativa diagnóstica para esta patología. Te invitamos a considerarlo en tu práctica clínica. I'm not sure if someone uh, here will, would like to comment on that. Would you change your management to up to ultrasound first, or would you just keep getting that upper GI first? Jose, I'm happy to comment. I, I think that there has been ultrasound interest in using ultrasound for a long time, but ultrasound is one of those uh, imaging studies that is very, very dependent on the person who performs the ultrasound. So, I mean, we're fortunate we can get ultrasounds in the middle of the night and that kind of thing, but the other challenge is the availability. So personally, I would rely way more on an upper GI than I would on an ultrasound. And the issue of switch, you know, the, the reversal of the, of the vessels at the root of the mesentery, you know, I, I, I'm not familiar with this article, so this is great to see this, but my understanding was that that was not a very reliable way to um, to make the diagnosis. And since I don't speak Spanish, I have to admit that I didn't potentially get all of the information from the, uh, from the presentation. Oh, the video was captioned. Did, did, did you not? Okay. It's I a saw, little small I saw for us here in the Zoom room. Oh, the other, the other article, the other videos are in English. That was the only one. Okay, let's, you wanna say something, Todd? Sorry? No, let's go on to the next one. Let's go on to the next one, please. Uh, let's see if I can click here. Okay, case number two. Let's say we're on call. It's 11 p.m. and we get a seven-year-old female with a 24-hour 24 history of right lower quadrant pain. She's stable, but she's tender on right lower quadrant. White blood cell is 17,000. Urine is normal. And we get an ultrasound. We're lucky enough to get an ultrasound at that point in during the night. And it shows non-complicated appendicitis. So what would, you, what would your management be? A laparotopy or laparoscopy tonight, book the case for tomorrow, laparotomy or laparoscopy tomorrow, admit and give her a IV antibiotics or even treat her as an outpatient with oral antibiotics. 
Jose, appendicitis yeah. or not? <laughs> appendicitis or not? Uh, no appendicitis. Let's okay. make it more, more difficult. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guess. Do you want to you want to explain to us why why would you ask that? I I, I think I I, I I understand what you're trying to point out here. Right. The the studies uh, currently, I think uh, you know what this uh, is hoping to highlight is the ability to use non-operative management of appendicitis in certain cases. But um, uh, the studies that we have uh, show that uh, having the presence of an appendicitis actually uh, has about a fifty percent failure rate. Uh, so um, that's uh, you know uh, not good enough uh, for me. Uh, so uh, most of us actually use the presence of an appendicitis as a no-go uh, for uh, non-operative management. So I think Dr. Arka gave a really good summary of the video we're just about to see, and she is updated on this topic. <laughs> so why don't we just roll the video? This is a relevant article published in the Annals of Surgery in June 2020. For decades, surgery has been the gold standard of treatment for appendicitis. Recently, the idea of using medical management with antibiotics in selected patients has been described in several studies, mostly in other populations. However, there is still not strong evidence to support the change in the way we treat appendicitis in general. This study shows the results of a five years follow up of a randomized clinical trial applied to 50 patients with uncomplicated appendicitis. They reported that the group randomized to surgery had no complications, while in the group randomized to non-surgical management, 46% of patients required appendectomy in the follow-up time. The surgical group had no readmissions, while half of the non-surgical group presented to the emergency room. Based on the results of this study, we can conclude that non-surgical management of appendicitis seems to be safe. However, almost half of patients required appendectomy in a five-year follow-up time. Approximately 70% would do a laparotomy or laparoscopy either today or tomorrow, but there's a 20% uh, being this uh, surgical audience that would actually treat with IV antibiotics. And I find that very interesting. And I, this, this could come from the results of this trial. I, I, personally, I agree with Dr. With Dr. Arca and so Jose, yeah, I think for this we're just going to have to fly through. We're already pretty far over. Um, yep. So let's just um, without One discussion, more? without discussion, just throw it up there and we'll watch it and keep going. Sure. Cool. Sorry, this is a, a two two year old boy with a neuroblastoma. It's a high risk neuroblastoma. It has image-defined risk factors. In the case, it's both renal arteries. Uh, let's say the tumor responded well to chemotherapy, but still a very large mass. So we're at the fifth cycle reassessment re for surgery. What would be the options be? Uh, more chemotherapy, debulking surgery, local radiotherapy, <clears throat> and surgical resection as complete as possible. Um, so let's go with it. Yeah, let's just go play the video and put the poll yeah. up at the same time. So play the next slide. Well published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2020. Complete resection of intermediate risk neuroblastoma doesn't provide any surgical benefit, but it is not known whether this applies to high risk neuroblastoma, especially because complete resection of this type of tumor can involve a really complex and morbid procedure. In this report by the CEOPEN group, they evaluated the impact of the extent of primary tumor resection on survival and local progression. 1,531 patients with stage 4 high-risk neuroblastoma were categorized as complete or incomplete microscopic resection at the moment of surgery. The results show that 5-year event-free survival and overall survival were significantly higher with complete resection. Local progression was also lower with complete resection when compared with incomplete resection. So, as a conclusion, in patients with stage 4 neuroblastoma, complete resection, even if risky, provides better overall and event-free survival. I see Dan Van Allman clapping, so there you go. Let's keep going, yeah. He agreed. Well, Dr. Yeah. Van Allman actually published this in 
2017, but this is coming from a European group. So can someone just click the next slide? And with, so we're at prenatal counseling. We're uh, we're looking at a baby, 24 week scan with le left diaphragmatic hernia. Her um, prognostic factors look really terrible. Liver's up. Uh, Lock to her radius 1.0. Lung volume is less than 15 ml. What would you recommend? A would be referral to ECMO center, standard care, interior center, and referral only if ECMO is needed post birth, postnatally, fetal treatment with tracheal occlusion, or fetal treatment with intrauterine surgery. Let's see the poll results and play the video, please. This article was published in July 2021 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Observational studies have shown that fetal fetoscopic endoluminal tracheal occlusion has been associated with increased survival among infants with severe pulmonary hypoplasia, but also increased preterm delivery. This article evaluated whether fetal increases postnatal survival compared to expectant prenatal care in a randomized controlled trial. 80 women carrying Fetuses with severe isolated left-sided congenital diaphragmatic hernia were randomized to feto at 27 to 29 weeks of gestation or to expectant care. Both treatment arms were followed by standardized postnatal care. The primary outcome was survival to discharge. Feto resulted in a significant benefit over expectant care with respect to survival to discharge. 40% versus 15% respectively. At six months of age, the survival was the same. Feto was associated with an increased risk of preterm pre-labor rupture of membranes and preterm labor. If you are caring for babies with severe congenital diaphragmatic hernia, feto should be considered for prenatal management. This art. Uh, MVA. A passenger, Glasgow Com scale is 12. She's unstable. She's going to be transferred to you. She's arriving in 10 minutes. And again, the topic of what would be your transfusion, your first choice of transfusion 20 ml saline bolus, 40 ml kilo saline bolus, uh, whatever your favorite ratio is of component therapy, red blood cells, frozen plasma and platelets, or alternative D, whole blood. Let's play the video, please. This is a relevant article published in the Journal of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery in June 2021. Trauma is the leading cause of death in children older than one year. Among adult trauma patients, whole blood as the initial resuscitation fluid has shown promising results. In children, there is positive data regarding this topic. This article investigated whether whole blood transfusion as an adjunct to component therapy in early resuscitation improved outcomes in critically injured children. 135 children aged between 1 and 17 years from the Trauma Quality Improvement Program in the 2017 database who received whole blood as an adjunct to component therapy were propensity score matched to 270 children receiving only component therapy. The main result of this study was a decrease in the transfusion volume at 4 and 24 hours. Even though mortality, length of stay, and major complications were the same, the whole blood group required fewer ventilation days. So, to improve outcomes in trauma patients, consider whole blood as a part of your initial resuscitation strategy. Um, this is whole blood uh, instead of, no, this is after saline, but this is instead uh, of component transfusion. Okay. Yeah. Cause it said, what would your first be? So I think that's why most people said saline. Then after yeah. that would be whole blood. So that's the big point there is you give, it sounds like the summary here, we're going to hear Rob talk about it more saline first for 20 cc per kilo, then whole blood. Is that, is that it? But because the other question said type specific blood, uh, it doesn't say any type of whole blood or whatever was it pack red blood cells but it's whole blood it sounds like it's whole blood yeah well that, okay. yeah that's rob you agree i i would agree that we should be going with normal saline based on the atls protocols I, I will tell you though um that nationwide in adults we are starting to see ambulance rigs travel with whole blood capabilities in adults and people are starting to use whole blood even earlier so is this coming saline. Down the, is it correct is this coming down the pipeline potentially 
But in the pediatric literature right now, ATLS guidelines um, would suggest initial bolus with, uh, with normal saline or crystalloid solution and then moving over. I have to, to tell uh, you, this is, cells. I love this it's, course. It's a change I, and it's an evolution. Yeah, because I, I mean, I don't know if it's pediatrics is different than adults. It seems like things change every single year we meet. Uh, Dan, were you going to say something? I was just going to ask that, you know, the challenge for whole blood is availability. But, you know, if you're saying that Briggs are start, you know, EMS folks are carrying that. I don't understand that. I guess it's universal donor uh, blood and whole blood. That's that's great. And um, that'll be great to see that evolve because I think the data supports it. It's just getting it. That's the challenge. It is. And that's been the big thing with regard to the pediatric. And we can talk about this later on and probably talk about it for the whole day if you wanted to. Um, but uh, having blood bank capabilities, especially uh, because thankfully for children, we don't use a lot of massive transfusion protocols. So I, I think you're seeing more of this in adults. Um, some of the pediatric centers are coming along um, slowly, but, but definitely we're seeing more. All right. Is, yeah, go ahead. Is there an age limit, Rob, that you would use this for? for a, I'm sorry, for whole blood? Yeah. So that, that's, that's a good question as well. Some centers are limiting to males. Um, some centers are limiting to um, children older than 15. It, it really um, just depends on your institution um, and how you're partnering. So I, I think my recommendation, if you're looking at whole blood right now, is to partner um, with your adult trauma surgeons um, that area to, to kind of work on it because it is a, a big utilization of the blood bank and, and see what their protocol would be. All right. This is awesome. We're running 15 minutes behind and we're only on the second talk. So this is what I, I warned everyone. Everyone knows around the world. The discussion is much more fun than the presentation. So be prepared to, to discuss, but we'll have to cut it short. Jose, uh, clearly yeah. everyone either said they either majorly changed or mostly changed. This was phenomenal. I appreciate the work you're doing. Our opening our eyes to not only our core journals, but the other journals. Thank your team. The team is phenomenal. Uh, congratulations, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Todd.